all my children one life to live. General Hospital, as the world turns, the young and the restless, who knows what those are? Some of us don't, so somebody tell us what that is. Soap operas. Everybody say drama. Soap operas. Drama. Dynasty. Dating myself here. Knott's Landing. <laughs> Dallas. Especially one episode in particular. Who shot JR? Some of us know that that is also drama, drama series from the late 70s, I believe, and then in the 80s. Scandal, Grey's Anatomy, How to Get Away with Murder, one of my daughter's favorite shows these days as she's in law school. <laughs> Briggerton, who knows what these are? what they have in common. There are also various series of drama, but they were written by Shonda Rhimes, who hails from University Park, Illinois, and attended the high school of, that my children attended, Marion Catholic High School. But she did a great job writing drama. Genesis. Exodus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hopefully we all know what these are, but say it with me. These are also drama. According to recent data, the average adult in America watches nearly three hours of television a day. Not all drama series, but likely all drama. Because if you watch the news, for instance, what is that but drama? I remember a conscious thought as a child when I realized, wow, we spend a lot of time taking in fictional drama. As I became an adult, I realized that life, all by itself, is full of drama. And sometimes the addiction to TV, television, is an escape from our own drama. Sometimes we binge watch drama, we get excitement and can escape from our own drama by watching the extreme drama that can be displayed on television, like Who Shot J.R.? One of the first cliffhangers of television drama, at least in my memory, from the 1979-80 series of Dallas. Recently, on a drama series called Sisters, anybody watch Sisters? That is written and created by Tyler Perry. A woman is pregnant with fraternal twins, and there are two fathers. One for each twin. George, I'll ask you later if that's possible. I, I, I know some folks have researched it once they saw it on television. Wrap your head around that. Drama. Here's a new news flash. The human reality is drama. And while fictional television shows have the luxury of writing some of the most extreme drama the mind can imagine, Unfortunately, the human mind can indeed imagine and carry out extreme drama, not just for shows, but for real. As I stated in one of my last sermons, may have been my last sermon, it matters how we treat one another. 
It matters because it's all drama, and drama impacts the participants, including children, and it impacts us all because of this inescapable network of mutuality that Dr. King taught us about, that what impacts one directly impacts us all indirectly, and, and, and I add directly. And, and the biblical story today of Joseph and his brothers and father shows that questionable treatment of one another can impact us all. The story is a depiction of family drama. It's a nuclear family of sorts as Jacob, who is the grandson of Abraham, part of the lineage that Pastor Sarah preached about last week that God gave Abraham a vision that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. Well, Jacob is part of that lineage. God promised Abraham and Jacob is the grandson and has 12 sons and there's other children, drama. Joseph is the second to the youngest of Jacob's sons and according to the text for today, his father Jacob also known as Israel, loved him more than the others because he was born in Jacob's old age. And verse 4 says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. This is the root of this particular family drama. But before we go too far into the story, here's another thought from my, as I reflect back on my growth from child to now young adult, at that point, young adult Christian at this point, that's what I'm gonna share with you, that God gives us family to learn how to treat one another, to practice things like forgiveness. That was a thought I had as a, as a young adult Christian staying in the church and trying to, to learn what was being taught. So for the purposes of this sermon and hopefully beyond, we will extend the idea of family. There's the nuclear family, the extended family, the human family, the church family, the body of Christ. Someone prayed this morning about their workplace family. You get the idea that in our lifetimes, we become parts of families, people in close relationship, bonded by some type of tie. And for many reasons, things can get complicated because we're human and the result is drama. Another conscious thought as I grew up as a Christian, and this one came while I was in seminary, that the Bible is often a mirror to the human condition. And so this story of Joseph, full of all the things that make a good drama, jealousy, hatred, plots and schemes, lies, and, and as the late Frankie Beverly sang, joy and pain. The human experience in the scriptures is a mirror to the actual human experience, the human family, and if you will, and if it is indeed a mirror, what role are you playing? Let's go to the text and, and let's outline the full story. Joseph, again, according to the text, is the favorite son of Jacob, also known as Israel because God changed his name. So the 12 tribes of Israel are Jacob's 12 sons, and Joseph is the 11th son. And Joseph is a dreamer. Verse 6, he tells his first dream to his brothers. He said, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your she sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Shortly after, Joseph tells them another similar dream. It's in the text, and verse 10 says, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And I intended for verse 11 to be included in that. It's not 
in the bulletin, it's in your Bible, verse 11 says, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The brothers start scheming, plot to kill him, see him one day in the field, and in this famous line in verse 19, they say to each other, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him, scheming. Then, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. They didn't just have a problem with him, they had a problem with his dreams. Reuben takes heart and has a heart and talks to them, talks them out of killing him. They throw him in a pit instead, and later in the text, they actually sell Joseph into slavery. See, the Joseph story goes from Genesis 37 and is sprinkled all the way through Genesis 50. The long story which goes into Genesis 50 is that Joseph once sold, was once also sold to the Israelites into slavery, ends up in Egypt, a slave to Potiphar, if you don't know the story, some of these names might sound familiar. Potiphar's wife, some of us have heard Potiphar's wife. Well, what did Potiphar's wife do? Potiphar's wife tempts Joseph, who's a slave to Potiphar, and falsely accuses Joseph. Joseph then goes to prison, falsely incarcerated in prison. While in prison, Joseph dreams and interprets dreams and has the opportunity to go before Pharaoh to help Pharaoh with the dream he's struggling with, the ruler of the land. Pharaoh is so grateful to receive an interpretation of his dreams that he gives Joseph authority in all of Egypt. In a time of abundance in Egypt, and this is a wonderful dramatic story, I hope you read it, uh, over the next week or so, Genesis 37 to 50, in the time of abundance in Egypt, and now Joseph is out of prison, out of slavery, out of prison, the head of Egypt. Joseph stores up grain such that in the severe famine that came upon all the land, everyone came to Joseph in Egypt for grain, for food. Even his brothers find themselves going to search out this one who has all this grain because they are suffering in the famine and they don't know that it's Joseph who's the one, who's the leader with all the grain. But their dad send them from Canaan and say, go to Egypt and get some of that grain. And they go, having no idea that it's Joseph who they sold into slavery, and, and he's the now the man in charge and the one who was able to help them. And so they travel to Egypt during the famine in search of food, and lo and behold, they soon discover that their brother has authority of all of Egypt and of all the grain. And they bow down to their brother and beg forgiveness. And Joseph's dream comes true after all, and it saves their lives. What a story, what a drama. It has it all, jealousy and compassion, joy and pain, lies and deception and truth, slavery, incarceration, famine, abundance, victory, forgiveness, full circle moments all through many characters. And it may have brought some to mind and something to mind in your own drama. And my question is, what role do you play in the family drama, the human family, the nuclear family, the church family, the workplace family? What role do you play? Before we get into the role, let me give you my first point. And I don't usually preach three-point sermons, but, but it, it's going to work today. I think we, we may have more than three points, but work with me here. Here is point one. Points usually help for people taking notes. Be willing to admit your role. And the lessons of the text and the sermon. In other words, don't ignore sermons that speak to you. I'm going to let that marinate for a minute. See, part of the reason I believe there's so much drama in our lives, in life in general, is that people are not willing to admit their fault 
faults, their shortcomings, that they are indeed human and are not willing to get help and not willing to change. And listening to sermons for those who come to church, whether they're mine or Pastor Sarah's or any other preacher's sermon that is speaking to your heart, but being unwilling to apply what you've heard and learned is to do yourself a disservice. I'm in the text, but actually I'm in the New Testament text for today when Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Hebrews 4, 12 says it this way, For the word of God is alive and active. In other words, you should realize that every once in a while it's going to touch because it's alive and it's active. The text says, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Sounds like people of God have been wrestling with human behavior for a long time and we, we do so from a place, those of us who do so, we do it from a place of hope, sometimes radical hope that things and people can change and people can work for good and people can be healed and work together like a well-oiled machine, whether it's family or work, at work, church, the human family, some of us have crazy hope that life can be better. Call us dreamers if you want. When the word comes to you and you know it's speaking to your heart, this is why we sing, order my steps. When you know it's speaking to you, is it possible that God sent it just for you? It's alive and it's active and it comes from a place of hope. Often it comes from a dreamer. What would life be like without people who believed that it can all get better? What would life be like without dreamers? This brings me to my second point. Don't despise dreamers. What role do you play? Are you a dreamer, the dreamer? If, are you the dreamer of your family who sees what others can't see? The dreamer of the workplace who says, no, we can be better and do better. Things can get better. Are you the dreamer in the nuclear family? If not, who is the dreamer? Get your eyes on the dreamer in your spaces and places and families. Why do people despise dreamers? Well, dreamers usually reflect change. Thank you, Pastor Sarah, conversation we were having last week. Joseph's dream told his brothers that he would go from being their, at least their equal, or maybe because they were older, they viewed him, they viewed themselves as higher than him. But the dream goes from him at least being their equal or beneath them to him being above them and authority over them. But it wasn't for bad. We ultimately know, which is why I told you the whole story, it was for good. But the dream by itself threatened them. It challenged all their beliefs. And surely, they felt they had authority based on age. Joseph's dream challenged all their privilege they had as older siblings. And, and at the end of the day, it reflected change. And change is hard. I was at a workshop two weekends ago. And a, the, one of the plenary um, talks was on change. And the speaker said that if you talk to neurologists, they will tell you that change and physical pain look the same to the brain. Fires the same in the brain and that this is why we resist. We did this activity where we pressed against each other's hands. It's natural to resist change. 
That's why change is so hard. That's why dreamers, when they share their dreams, can impact some of us so much because the change that is described might translate like physical pain in our brain. We don't even realize it, but we react to the change. Hear their reaction again. Here comes that dreamer. Come and let us kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him and then let's see what becomes of his dreams. They hated his dream as much as they hated him. But here's what we need to know about dreamers. God chooses dreamers. God gives all of us gifts. Some of us are dreamers, visionaries. Some of us are implementers. We can help get things done. Some of us care for the people along on the ride, whether it's the family, work, church, community. But somebody is the dreamer, and I believe God chooses the dreamers, gives people dreams. And just like in the text, it's usually for the common good. God chooses dreamers, my theology, for the common good. So in your family, who's the dreamer? Did you get them in mind yet? Here's my suggestion. Take care of the dreamer. Be like Reuben. Don't, don't fight because you're here hearing this message. That's why now you know. It was for the common good. Don't, don't fight the dreamer. Take care of the dreamer. Don't bully the dreamer. Bullying happens in all types of family. Be careful. Don't bully the dreamer. Be like Reuben, the brother with a heart who speaks up, tries to do what is right, took a risk because they could have said, we're going to throw you in there with them if you keep talking. He took a risk to save his brother's life, and that's what he did. What role do you play? One suggestion is to be like Reuben and protect the dreamer, but, but what about Jacob, the father, the dad, the elder in the whole story? We can certainly caution parents about having favorites. That's another sermon for another day. But I like this about Jacob in the story. After Joseph tells the second dream, in verse 11, says his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Jacob seems to be withholding judgment for some reason. Could it be that in his many years of life, he's come to appreciate dreamers? After all, he's the grandson of Abraham to whom God came in a vision and said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. And surely he knows this story. Might Jacob in his life experience and wisdom and faith be hearing Joseph's dream through his spiritual ear? Or as my, my mentor, Dr. Braxton, says, out his third ear, he's, he's hearing and he's withholding judgment. He might even be saying, God, I see you. I see you. Is this the role that you play? The elder in the space? Because all families have elders, including the church family. And there's a, a lesson here for the elders, and that is to apply godly wisdom, some wisdom you've learned down through the years, which includes seeing some dreams come true. That when we've seen some dreams come true, we're not so quick to kill the dreamer or discourage the dreamer. And when we're the elder in the space, can we withhold judgment and try to hear with our third ear, our spiritual ear, like Jacob did. And I'd like to believe that he prayed for all his sons, the dreamer and the jealous one. And that he prayed that God's will would be done. All families need dreamers. All families need wise elders. What role do you play? This brings me to my last point. We all have a role to play. Step up in the family and be intentional about playing a good role for the common good. Just like God chooses dreamers, God gives us all talents and gifts and abilities. Discover your talents. 
See, part of the time, the reason people get jealous of others is because they don't know that which is within them. What has God given me? And so it's easy to get jealous. Discover your talents, your goals, your gifts, your calling. Develop those gifts and play a greater role in your family, in the human family, in the workplace family, in the church family, all for the common good. Be a, better, be a part of a better story, a greater future, a victorious outcome. Learn from history. You know, every round, I believe, goes higher or, and higher, at least it should, until the beloved community comes and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. The Holy Spirit dropped that in my spirit. I started to say, until thy kingdom come. But you know, sometimes that kingdom language gives the wrong connotation. It is still lording over. How about when thy beloved community comes? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For that is the dream that the beloved community comes where dreamers aren't despised and assassinated but loved and supported until God's divine will is done. The role you play in family drama matters. Dreams matter. Using wisdom matters. How we treat one another matters. Hearing messages that move you towards change and being willing to explore that journey matters. It matters so much that as I close, hear from the mouth of Jesus how much it matters. Luke 6, 47, and Fred read it, I'll read it again. I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. That one is like a man, a person, building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood rose, the river burst again, that house could not shake, couldn't shake, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, it quickly collapsed. And great was the ruin of that house. How you treat people in the family, human family, nuclear family, workplace family, church family, and whether we apply the word to our lives can come down to very practical things, foundation building. How do we build a solid foundation for family? For your family, my family, the church family, the work family, love, Wisdom, dreaming, imagining, withholding judgment, caring for one another, caring for yourself, getting the support that you need. Care enough about the foundation you're a part of building that you pay attention to the role in the drama that you are playing and do your best because we're building a, a foundation who intentionally puts a crack in a foundation? Who intentionally disturbs what's being built? Do your best to develop your gifts to play a better role in the drama, because it's going to be drama. But remember that it's for the common good. God bless you.